Hello everybody, my name is Richard Smith. I'm the director of the Tank Museum and today I'm going to look at another one of my top five tanks. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Now, when you're looking at top fives and thinking about top fives, the really key part is what's the criteria that I'm going to use? What are the features I'm trying to draw out, the meaning I'm trying to derive? And you can, in a collection like this, pick almost any five vehicles to cover almost any subject. And it's one of the great joys of being here, that we've got this richness of collection from which we can explore the subject. And what we're going to think about today is parenting through the medium of tanks. Now, generally, in armoured warfare, like in, in any other technology field, uh, change comes from evolution rather than revolution. There you are know, lots of small steps as people blunder from crisis to crisis, trying to solve the problem that's immediately in front of them, which results in change over a period of time. But every now and then, what you get is something which has a greater degree of change than that, something where there's a before and an after, a parent vehicle, a parent piece of technology that drives everything that comes after it. And uh, this happens in multiple fields. These before and after moments, you can think, you know, think Monty Python, think the Atari games console, uh, the tea bag. Uh, you can think about Oxford United's reinvention of football in the 1986 World Cup final. These are moments where there's a before and after and the world is never the same again afterwards. So what we're going to look at today is these vehicles which are milestones, which are turning points, which shape the world in a different way. And we're going to look at five vehicles that are transformational. Well, four that are transformational and one that should have been, but we'll come to that later. Let's get started. Number five on my top five list today is the Centurion Mark I. Now, it's no secret that we really like Centurions here at the Tank Museum. You can make a really strong case for saying that Centurion is the, the best ever tank design from anywhere at any point. And these things are magnificent. But why is it on my top five list of turning point before and after vehicles? Well, you know, as ever, in the Centurion, you'd see both evolution and revolution. And there's a lot of evolution in this tank. You can see physically in the pattern of the vehicle, you can see uh, Cromwell and Comet that came before it. If you look at the components here, you've got uh, a Meteor engine inside, you've got a 17 pounder, well, it's a sort of latest derivative of 17 pounder. Uh, the, 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 the suspension system, you can track back to the American Christie suspension. Uh, you've got sloped armour that's not been seen uh, but it's been seen before on things like the T-34 and all throughout the Second World War. But with Centurion what you have coming together in a single vehicle for the first time is all of those lessons simultaneously and it's the pulling together of every important lesson of the Second World War that makes this a turning point vehicle. And you've got to remember that Centurion is, in some ways, the last Second World War tank. This comes in in May 1945, so right at the end, you know, just after the Second World War. But it gets there, it's only been started in development in September 1943. I mean, that's kind of, you know, we're talking 20 months in total of development time to produce something that's truly remarkable. And the truly remarkable output from this is what in practice the world's first main battle tank. A tank which combines all the key roles a tank can take on the battlefield. And while it includes ideas that have already been there before, you can see this looks like a different generation of vehicle. 
and such a different generation of vehicle that it's from this that you can say every major Western tank design subsequently derives. This births what's already 80 years of tank development and it sees no sign of slowing down yet. So because this is the parent vehicle, the turning point which births the main battle tank and modern armour today, that in itself was at the bleeding edge of technology for over 50 years, the Centurion Mark I takes number five on my top five list today. Number four on my top five list of tanks today, tanks which change the world where there's a before and an after, is the T-34-76. Now, the T-34 is uh, designed by a chap called Mikhail Koshkin, and the design starts in 1934. The, the Russian tanks and Soviet tanks, the number is the date of the design. It's always a useful guideline to see when the tank dates from. This tank goes into service in 1940. Um, interesting if you think about that design time, compare it to some of the other ones talking about today. So six year design time for the T-34. But this is a leap forward. This is a tank which in practice makes every other tank obsolete. Remember that when you're looking at this 76 mm gun next to me, this gun's being used at a time when the Germans are on you know, 20 mm guns on Panzer II as kind of the workhorse uh, of their army. This gun at the time is enormous. And that gun combines with the, the Christie-inspired suspension system, uh, this 60-degree uh, uh, sloping armour, which makes incredibly effective use of the armour plate. And what you get with these in combination is a devastatingly effective system. And it's not to say that this is a perfect tank. There are legions of problems of the T-34 about which one could expand forever. Uh, you know, it's uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, it leaks, for heaven's sake. Uh, there's, yeah, seats are a kind of optional extra. It's physically hard to drive. They're difficult to fight in. There's no turret basket inside. Uh, they get knocked out in enormous numbers. But it's also a tank that the German general von Keist called the finest tank in the world. And this is a tank as a parent vehicle, as a vehicle for which there's a before and after, which almost defines the entire school of armour that comes after it. Every subsequent Soviet design in practice derives from the T-34. It, it drives not only the Soviet designs, but it drives the designs of their opponents as well. You can, in Panther, see something that's a direct response to the German experience of fighting against T-34. Um, if you look at Ukraine at the moment, the vast majority of the tanks you see in Ukraine are in practice derivatives of T-34. Everything up to, you could really argue, the T-72 derivatives, things like T-80, T-90, um, is in practice an updated T-34. If you think about T, uh, T-90, T-72s, low slung, thick armour, quite difficult to operate, pretty cramped and not great ergonomics inside, dirty great big gun. These are the salient features of T-34 80 years later. This is a tank that defines multiple generations of what comes after it. The example here is actually a particularly nice one. This is on loan to us from the Parola Museum uh, in Finland. It's a wonderful collection uh, of, of armour. Um, and this is one of the oldest T-34s uh, left in existence. We think this is either the second or third, third oldest T-34 left in the world and we're delighted to have it here on loan. So this vehicle, because it defines a generation, because it is clearly a before and after, the things before are obsolete, the things after are designed in its image. This is a parent of multiple generations. T-34-76 is number four on my top five list of tanks today. Number three on my top five list of tanks today is what I would consider to be one of the most interesting vehicles in the entire Tank Museum collection. It's the Ram Kangaroo. 
Now, the ram kangaroo is the brainchild of a chap called Guy Simmons, who commands the Canadian Corps in Normandy in the Second World War. And the problem he's trying to solve is how do you get the infantry to keep up with an armoured advance without being killed? And the ram kangaroo is kind of the second derivative of his solution to this. The, the first versions you, they were coming up with uh, were based on priest uh, self-propelled uh, uh, gun vehicles. And they were used for excess armour plate, which they had lying around the battlefield or cutting up from tanks that had been knocked out, to make them into what we'd now call armoured personnel carriers. Um, and the, 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 the initial kangaroos were incredibly important, particularly Operation Totalize in the summer of 1944. So they, they prove their concept and then what they do is they, they take the RAM, which is a Canadian vehicle, which they've got a lot of spare ones because everything's shifted to Sherman. And off the basis of the RAM, they then turn the next generation, the autumn of 1944, and these become infantry carrying vehicles. And they're not perfect. I mean, they, 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 you know, no top covers, apparently a bit of a problem. And if you want to get out of it, you have to climb over the top. There's no fancy things like doors to use to go in and out. But it does a job and it gets extremely significant, keeping the momentum of the Allied advances going through that autumn of 1944 in particular. But the RAM is, in some ways, an exception to the rule I gave myself for my list. The, the list today is about turning point vehicles. It's about before and afters. And the RAM should have been a vehicle for which there was a before and an after, but actually, bizarrely, turned out to be much less influential than I think it should have been. Now, this infantry tank cooperation thing is a really big deal and started, not in the Second World War, but it started in the First World War as an issue. So infantry and tanks are working as a team in the very first day of armoured warfare in September 1916. And in the Battle of Combray in November 1917, there's a huge attempt to try and burst through German lines, and it doesn't quite work. And one of the pieces of feedback in the reports after the Battle of Combray was that the infantry were unable to sustain this advance and there's a line in a, in a report in uh, November 1917 that says the infantry must be brought forward by any means other than foot. And actually what you get after that is you get um, uh, the Mark 9, for instance, the, it was the first um, dedicated armoured personnel carrier in the First World War. You, it had um, uh, Mark 5 star vehicles designed to carry infantry. So they kind of addressed the problem in the First World War. You then get this dropping out in the Second World War. Tank infantry cooperation remains a challenge in the Second World War. Different countries try and uh, tackle it in different ways. So the Russians use you know, tank riders, you know, guys actually being on the tanks themselves. They're used by the Allies in the West as well. Um, the Germans use half-tracks. The problem with tank riders and half-tracks, they are successful in the allowing infantry to keep up a bit, but they don't do quite so well in the infantry not being killed bit. And what you get with, though, with these uh, kangaroos, the priest version and the ram version, you get an evolution of this process where they actually begin to give the infantry tank level protection. And that should have changed the way in which armoured warfare works. But it drops out again after the Second World War. Once again, infantry get a lighter level of protection. It's a lesson that gets seems to be constantly relearned generation after generation. So what we're seeing at the moment um, in, in uh, the, the Russian developments and the Israeli developments is the Israelis are using uh, old Merkava tanks as infantry carriers. The Russian T-14 series has got an infantry carrying version. Uh, that, that T-14 series infantry carrying version, this would be like the Americans or the British having a, an Abrams converted to an armoured personnel carrier, a Challenger 2 armoured personnel carrier variant. It's a key lesson of you've got to get the infantry protected. If you look at the ex Russian experience of it, these attacks in the first part of 2022, tank attacks which are not appropriately escorted by infantry can go horribly wrong. The ram and the experience of the ram kangaroo in the Second World War should have embedded this lesson forever. This should have been and before and after vehicle, a vehicle which changed the way people conceived 
of an armoured battle happening. It didn't. In some ways, you could say I shouldn't have included it in today's list, but it's my list and I get to choose. But you might want to discuss in the chat, why wasn't this the revolution it should have been? But because I think it ought to have been a revolution, I've included it on my list at number three in today's top five list. Number two on my top five list of tanks today is a tank which actually rather divides opinion, and to my surprise, to be honest, it's the Carden Lloyd Carrier. Now, Lindy Beige actually put this in his bottom five tanks, which I think of an appalling misjudgment uh, on the flimsy basis that it's a bit rubbish. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it doesn't work very well. You can, it gives people seasickness when they drive it, it, it all sorts of vibration, uh, limited range, and a, an angry child with a hand grenade could destroy it in a heartbeat. But I think we should see through those minor flaws to a vehicle that is fundamentally important in the development of armoured warfare and is another vehicle for which there's a before and an after, a vehicle which is a parent of other vehicles which becomes enormously significant in this area. And I think it's really important for two different reasons and the, the, the two are connected. The first one is about the concept that it represents and the person who comes up with that concept. The guy who designs not this particular vehicle, but who comes up with the concept of the tankette, the kind of the mini tank, uh, is a guy called Gifford Martell. And Gifford Martell is one of these colossus figures that bestrides early tank development. It's, it's, he's one of these people, it's difficult to, to overstate his importance. Uh, he's a First World War soldier, he's a, he's, a, he's a Royal Engineer, and he gets involved in uh, uh, the tank corps really right at the beginning. He's kind of responsible for uh, setting up the obstacle course uh, in, uh, in Elverdon, where they, they're doing their first training. Uh, and within the development of the tank corps, he becomes a really key figure. You've got the, the top guy in the tank corps, is a guy called General Ellis. His chief of staff is JFC Fuller, who I've done a talk about before, uh, and Fuller's right-hand man is Martel, and Martel is a thinker and a doer. Uh, and as early as the autumn of 1916, he's writing a paper called looking at this, the future tank army of a, of a mechanised warfare driven by armoured vehicles. And he's a guy who can not only theorise, but can do it in the real world. So Martel uh, not only uh, then comes up with a whole bunch of designs which end up being really important in terms of how people use armour, he comes up with uh, effectively the, the, the concept and early designs of, of all the vehicles we subsequently see in 79th Armour Division, you know, bridging tanks, mine clearing tanks, uh, uh, floating tanks, all these sorts of things. They, they, Martel is pivotal in coming up with these concepts, but also as a battlefield commander, uh, Martel commands the 50th Division uh, in uh, the Second World War, in, in the Fall of France battles, and it's Martel's division that launches the Arras counter-attack that brings the German assault uh, to a, at least a pause that you could argue enables Dunkirk to happen. This guy is really, really good. And Martel, having had his experience in the First World War, comes up with this idea of the, the fully armoured battle. And Martel then, from that, recognises the fact the range of vehicles you need is different to the ones that existed. And he achieves, then at that point, what every British engineer would love to say they have done. Martel retreats to his shed, and in his shed comes up with a new revolutionary design. Every engineer wants to be that person. This is the crucial role of sheds in the development of technology. And Martel comes up with this idea of a tankette that mobilises and armours functions other than the tank itself, other than the, 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 the tip of the spear. He sees a fully mobile armoured battlefield of which this type of vehicle plays a key role. 
Uh, and the, the design is subsequently taken up and then it spawns off in various different ways. So Martel and Martel's thinking about the concept of armoured warfare is fundamentally linked to this vehicle. And the vehicle itself is of outstanding importance, not because it's its own effectiveness, but because of the ideas that, it, that subsequently flow from it. From the Card and Lloyd comes an entire generation of vehicles. Uh, the Card and Lloyd itself is used by about something like 16 different countries, but it's copied even further than that. And when you look at the vehicles being used in May 1940 across all armies, a huge proportion of them derive from the Card and Lloyd. So you, it's copied by the Italians and the French and the Japanese. The Panzer I is effectively a Card and Lloyd derivative. Uh, and of course, most famously, uh, the universal carrier, the Bren gun carrier uh, uh, from the British side is, is, you can see the Bren gun carrier is a derivative of Card and Lloyd. It's a crucial step in the development of armoured vehicles. Now, the ones I've just named, of course, quite a lot of those turn out to be rubbish too, but that doesn't detract from the fact that that really is an entire generation that comes from this. So because it's this critical step in the development of a mechanised army, it changes the concept of what you think a tank looks like and what an armoured vehicle does. It's not a huge leap to say that the Card and Lloyd is not merely the parent of that generation of vehicles, but is really the parent, together with Martel, of the concept of what we now think of as armoured divisions of that sweeping armoured warfare of the Second World War and beyond. And all of those come back to this vehicle and this idea. And that's why the Carden Lloyd carrier is number two on my top five list of tanks today. Number one on my top five list today is a tank for which, to be honest, the conservation efforts have fallen a little bit short. Uh, to be honest, this is the only bit that's left. But that doesn't detract from the fact that what was uh, known at that point as HMLS Centipede, or mo much more famously uh, known as Mother, was possibly the single most important tank ever. Uh, and while Little Willie, for instance, is a critical vehicle, is the first tank, it's Mother that was the tank that reflects what was subsequently seen on the battlefield. Mother was the second ever tank, but when we're thinking about turning point vehicles, about which there was a before and an after, about parent vehicles, this one, for heaven's sake, is called Mother. This is the ultimate before and after vehicle. No one actually knows why Mother, incidentally, was called Mother, and it could be it was the mother of all tanks. Um, Equally, it could be that the British Army seemed to have taken to calling lots of big, large, ugly metal objects Mother, and it could just be along those trends, but that's a complete diversion. So Mother, terribly important vehicle. Um, you, you really got to think of Mother as the first Mark I tank. So it's designed under the supervision of a chap called Walter Wilson. It's really a sort of technology genius. And the design moves at breakneck speed. So the concept for a tank emerges in October 1914. Wilson's design is demonstrated on the 13th of January 1916. That's a 15-month development period. Think of that in the context of Centurion and T-34. These guys are racing and it's shown off uh, to the, the great and the good at the beginning of February 1916, they see this as something which could be a game changer and the rest, as they say, literally and metaphorically, is history. Now, Mother's successful trial effectively spawns all the rest of the First World War tanks. These form the backbone of every major army for the subsequent hundred years, and it doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. If you want to look at the future, always look at Star Wars. The existence of mobile protected fire platforms looks like it's got a future as well, and it all derives from Mother. Now, Mother's fate 
is actually unknown. The, uh, the, the tank comes back to Bovington uh, after all the trials and, uh, and everything else are completed. And there's a photograph here of Bovington in Bovington after the uh, First World War. Uh, the official story is that in 1940, when everyone's taking down their iron railings and all that kind of stuff, that Mother goes for scrap. There's an unofficial story that Mother is buried somewhere in the Bovington area. And there's probably a future TV show uh, called Digging Up Mother, which we probably ought to look at. Whether it really is here, goodness knows. But it's worth thinking about Mother as a vehicle for a while. In itself, no consequence. It's a test bed, it doesn't do anything. It's not connected uh, to uh, magnificent events on the battlefield. But it was the evolution of the lessons from Little Willie, and it's the pulling together of different technologies that makes a new world possible. And Mother represents a revolution as well as an evolution. If the trials of 1916 had not gone well, then tank as we know it either wouldn't have existed today or even worse would have been invented by the French. So therefore mother is the ultimate parent vehicle and is number one on my top five list of tanks. Well I hope you uh, enjoy my top five tanks today. Uh, do pick your own in the chat beneath. It's, Picking these vehicles is a joy in itself, and it's something which shouldn't just be confined to people who work here at the Tank Museum. If you did enjoy today's video though, please do like it, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, support us on Patreon, buy something from our online shop. Your support is enormously appreciated and helps us do what we do here at the Tank Museum. Thank you very much.